Our world is presently engulfed in absolute chaos. Nobody seems to know where we are headed. However, the Bible clearly prophesies where we are going and how present world events are going to end up. We'll investigate what the prophecies foretell on today's edition of Politics and Religion. Look, there are two things I don't discuss, politics and religion. In my house, we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. I'll talk to you about anything except politics and religion. I never talk about politics and religion. Politics determines how we'll live here on Earth. Religion determines how we'll live forever. I'm Irvin Baxter. I think it's time we talk about it. Attempting to absorb all of the events that are happening in our world right now is sort of like drinking from a fire hose. It's almost too much to take in because the whole world seems to be rocking and reeling right now. Everybody is still wondering uh, what is really going on in the Middle East, what's going on with what they now call the Arab Spring. Uh, some political observers are wondering, will it be the Arab Spring or will it be the Arab uh, winter, the onset of a new Arab winter. We don't know that for sure. Uh, many people thought that when the revolution took place in Iran in 1979, that that was an Arab Spring, but it turned out to be the onset of a worst dictatorship that Iran had known for a long, long time. So uh, there's a lot of questions going on right now. I've talked to many very astute observers and asked them, what does this mean? What is going on with this revolution in the Middle East? And most of them shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. We, I've asked them, well, why do we go against Gaddafi, and why are we letting Assad have a free ride? Assad's killing more people than, Adolf, than Gaddafi killed, and yet uh, we've gone uh, against Gaddafi with full force and been unwilling to move against uh, Mr. Bashar Assad. So people shrug their shoulders again. Don't know the answer. Well, uh, we do have a source for answers, however, that's better than a direct line to the White House because sometimes I'm not even sure the White House knows what's going on. So what I want to do today is, first of all, talk about where we are right now, uh, what is happening, and then we'll try to make some sense of it. Let's do a quick overview of where we are at this present time. Um, we know that Back at the early part of the uh, Obama administration, he said, I will make peace in the Middle East my number one priority. And he did. He has absolutely done exactly what he said. Within two days of his inauguration, he appointed uh, former Senator uh, George Mitchell, who had crafted the peace in Northern Ireland. He appointed him to be a special envoy to the Middle East, hoping that he could work his magic there. Well, two years have now passed. It hasn't happened. From the very beginning, however, President Obama apparently thought he knew what the peace was going to look like and was determined to use all the leverage of the United States government to make it happen. And one of the things he apparently thought he knew was that Israel was going to have to return to 1967 borders. So he made a demand of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu when he took office about three months after Obama took office he said, I want you to stop all building in the settlements, including East Jerusalem. Well, Netanyahu didn't take to that very kindly, but after a lot of pressure and because Israel's friendship with the United States is so very important, uh, finally he decided, okay, I'm going to give this 10 months. Now, Netanyahu is not stupid. He's been around the block many times. He's held most of the major positions in the government of Israel. Uh, he came to the United States of America for his education. He was the ambassador from Israel to the United Nations, so he knows his way around very well. His uh, English is impeccable. Uh, also, uh, he knows how to use the media to his fullest advantage. So consequently, when you're dealing with Netanyahu, you're not dealing with uh, just a a rookie when it comes to political things. So what happened was Netanyahu, believing that he knew what would happen, said, okay, 
I'll go ahead and I'll declare a freeze, but not a permanent freeze, for 10 months. I'll declare a freeze for 10 months. I'll give you, President Obama, 10 months to get the talks going. So he did. He declared an absolute building freeze for 10 months. But he said after that, we're going to start building again. Well, nine months passed and still no peace talks, in spite of the fact that when President Obama said no freeze uh, in order for us to have talks, that's when Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinians, latched onto the idea and said, we won't go to the talks until you stop building there. Well, what this whole thing was designed to do was to send the message and to get it ingrained in everybody's psyche, including the people of Israel and including the people of the world, that whenever there was a peace deal, but undoubtedly the lines would be at the 1967 lines or very close to there. Now, one reason this happened was because the Arab community said that they would, if Israel would withdraw the 67 lines and re return all the land, that the members of the Arab League, there's 22 Arab nations, that they would make a peace treaty with Israel and that they would coexist, they would recognize Israel's right to exist. So that was Obama's entire goal. Now, uh, Netanyahu felt that he knew better. He did not believe that the Arabs would be willing to leave Israel alone. He believed that the Arabs wanted to trade land for peace and yet fully intended to someday destroy the Israeli entity, the, the Israeli nation. And so he set out a condition of his own. Since Obama and Abbas decided to make conditions, Netanyahu decided to make a condition. He said, we will not make peace until you recognize the right of Jews to live in a Jewish state. Well, nobody's ever been willing to do that because the Arabs had already decided, okay, we can make a temporary peace, but we've got to make sure there are enough Arabs inside the borders of Israel that because we multiply faster than Israelis do, they have two children or so per family, we have eight or ten per family, that we will soon outgrow them, then we will be able to outvote them, and then we will have an Arab prime minister of the nation of Israel. So when Netanyahu said we must have a, a Jewish nation for the Jewish people, Abbas has not been one to say that. Now, Netanyahu has said, with there should be a Palestinian nation for the Palestinian people. He said, now, I want you to say there should be a Jewish nation for the Jewish people. Well, Abbas has never been willing to say that. So consequently, uh, that's some of the stalemate that we're experiencing. Well, what happened after, the, after nine months, finally Abbas decides he's going to go scrambling to the peace table. Now, he thinks if he can give the illusion of progress, at the peace table that Netanyahu will be under incredible international pressure to continue the freeze in order to keep the peace talks going. However, after they met together for a couple of weeks and there were glowing reports from the media, oh, if things are going better than we ever thought they could, things are going wonderful, and then uh, President Obama asked Netanyahu to extend the peace talks a little further. Netanyahu said no. Uh, we already had 10 months. Abbas refused to come to the table for nine out of those 10 months. And now all of a sudden, uh, you want me to extend the freeze? I'm not going to do it. And there's no reason to do it because uh, we've, we've had talks many times with the Palestinians, and we were building the settlement areas right in the, mi in the middle of all that. He said, and, for the, and also, he started sort of putting a temporary freeze in the West Bank, but not in Jerusalem. Well, Obama said, including Jerusalem because Jerusalem's the other big, big issue. There's two big issues in all this, the location of the final borders and the status of Jerusalem. And Netanyahu said, this is our eternal capital. We don't ever intend to back up on the Jerusalem issue because Israel's already annexed Jerusalem. Furthermore, the Israeli government recently passed a law that the only way that the Israeli government can give away, can sign a peace treaty that gives away part of the nation of Israel, and that means the heartland of Israel, the part that, has, that is actually within the Israeli borders, is to get a supermajority, which I believe is a two-thirds majority vote, which is very, very difficult to get in the Israeli Knesset. So anyway, that's the way the whole thing has, has fleshed out. Well, uh, Abbas walks out of the talks after two weeks, and everybody tried to blame it on Netanyahu, but he wouldn't budge.
He just stood firm. Well, in the meantime, revolution starts sweeping through the Middle East, from Tunisia to Egypt, then it spread to Libya. There were uprisings in Bahrain. There were uprisings in many other places. Uh, they attempted to start in Jordan, but the, they were uh, quickly put down. They attempted to start in Iran. They were quickly put down. But the government of Egypt toppled. The government of Egypt uh, of Tunisia toppled. And so a lot was going on. Everybody was really – the attention really moved away from the Palestinian-Israeli talks to the bigger picture of what was actually going on inside the Arab world in the Arab Middle East. Well, so that put everything on the back burner for a little while, but everybody knew that it was only on the back burner for a little while. In the meantime, President Obama tries to revive uh, everything. Okay, now let's see what happened next. Now the Palestinians, assuming they will never get what they want because now then they've got this guy by the name of Netanyahu on their hands, who says, wait, we will not return to 67 borders. Those borders are not defensible. That leaves us nine miles wide at the waist. There's nothing in the UN resolutions that say we have to return to 67 borders. It says we must return to borders negotiated between the two parties and borders that will provide security. He said, we will have no security. These borders are indefensible. There's nobody can defend a nation that's nine miles wide at the waist when it takes less than one minute for a supersonic jet to go through that, the entire width of the country. He says, it's just not possible. So he says, we, we're not going back there. And Netanyahu has been consistent. He has never acted like that they were going back there. He has held the line uh, so consistently, well, little by little by little. Obama did not think that Netanyahu had the political fortitude to withstand the pressure of the United States. But he found out that Mr. Netanyahu was not going to yield. He was not belligerent, but he was just very, very firm. He all the time was trying to preserve the friendship of the United States uh, with the nation of Israel, and yet at the same time he knew that he had great friends in the United States of America that would come to his aid if it became necessary. He knew that if it came to a contest between uh, will the Congress stick with Obama or will they come to the aid of Israel, he knew from past experience that Obama was underestimating the influence of Israel with the people of the United States of America. Because the United States of America is a Judeo-Christian uh, country, even though Obama tried to deny that. He said this is not a Christian country, but the fact of the matter is it is a predominantly Christian country country and we are a bible-based people we have our our culture based in the bible and consequently we know how special the land of israel is the people of israel the jews wrote every word in the bible they wrote as they were moved on to the holy ghost they gave us our messiah so consequently uh, our whole system of law is based on the ten commandments and so we have a we have very strong ties that you don't break easily. It appears that Mr. Obama thought he could break them by saying this is not a Christian nation. However, it uh, just didn't work out that way. Now, we're going to finish our summary of where we are right now in the next segment of the program, and then we're going to go to, okay, how's it going to end up? All of this confusion, who knows what's going on? Well, if you know the prophecy of the Bible, you know what's going on. End Time Ministries presents End of the Age, a 30-minute commercial-free TV show hosted by Irvin Baxter. Every Monday, End of the Age airs on the Church Channel at 9 p.m., Daystar at 10 p.m., and on TBN every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., all Central Standard Time. On End of the Age, Irvin depicts how modern issues like an establishment of a one-world government, the religion of Islam, a coming World War III and more line up so clearly with Bible prophecies written over 2,000 years ago. To get tomorrow's news today, be sure to tune into End of the Age every Monday on the Church Channel at 9 p.m., Daystar at 10 p.m., and on TBN every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., all Central Standard Time. Visit endtime.com for more details or call us at 1-800-END-TIME. 
That's 1-800-363-8463. The Bible prophesies about four great spirits which